Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! At long last, I'll be answering your questions in this Q&A video. Let's get right to it! <clears throat> Question 1. Will you ever show your face? Well, yeah, you're looking at it. This is me. Oh, you mean like, uh, my actual human face? Very well. Annyeong! Alright, so I've actually shown my face before just a couple weeks ago in the serious FTC video. And it's a good thing I did because, as you can see, I've changed my hair! I enjoyed being blonde for about six years, and as I touched on in my channel update, I was just ready for a big change. It was pretty scary at first because the last time I seriously got a haircut was, I, I think I was in first grade? I've never tried having an unnatural color before either, so I haven't quite got the hang of how to maintain the pink, but um, it's been way more fun having short pink hair than I thought I would, and I hope you guys like it too. I'm sure your next question is, is Minnie Catherine getting a makeover to match? Yes, she is. Since the doll is a representation of myself, it only feels right to update her too. Changing the look of this channel's mascot character might not be the best move from a business standpoint, but it's good to have a fresh look for the new year. And I hope you still recognize her. Me. Us. I can just put her right here. Okay, let's dive into the questions. Has there ever been a doll that you didn't feel was worthy of being on Delightful? Like, have you ever made a doll and ended up not posting it because it sucked? Um, I think you know the answer to that. Uh, I do post all my dolls, bad or good. I like to show the mistakes and include those in the video. The most infamous one is definitely Nova. Uh, she was going so badly I really did just want to scrap her and forget the whole video, but then I decided, you know, that's just a part of art. And people ended up really liking that video because it shows that, you know, even if you do it professionally, you're still gonna make a sucky doll once in a while. <laughs> Now it's kind of become a joke on the channel. Poor girl can't catch a break. <laughs> Do you ever talk to your dolls when you're giving them a makeover? No. Would you ever consider making dolls of fans or fans' requests? I think the heart of my channel, and I hope this shows, is that everybody has the ability to create something they love with their own two hands. And I try my best to show you my process, give you the tips that I know about, um, because I believe you can make it yourself. You know, you don't need me. Also, from an artist's perspective, since I am the producer of the channel, um, I, you know, I've got to make projects that I love. If I have a passion for something, then it shows up in the artwork. It'll be a good doll. If I'm making someone else's idea, you know, my enthusiasm isn't going to be as strong as that person's enthusiasm. Maybe it's their original character or their favorite anime character. You know, if they make it, it'll be a much more precious doll than if I made it anyway. The most important thing is making something that you really truly want to create. So if my heart's not in it, I'm not gonna make it. I know you've got the power to do it though. Are you going to make an angel girlfriend for the demon doll? Um, I have no plans, and I would like to point out here that with the exception of Tatsuo and Juon, who are boyfriend characters, and I kind of hinted at maybe titanium and Irene Oxide having something, but um. Other than that, I really don't like to write backstories or pair my characters at all. I like to do the character design and then see how that gets interpreted by the viewers, you. I think it's more interesting as a character designer to see what the viewers pick up on and make backstories for. It's kind of a tribute to how well I've crafted the character visually. <laughs> so I try not to pair my characters or give them backstories. Again, with the exception of Tatsuo and Juan, who are a pride celebration thing. So, no, no immediate plans to give any of my dolls a lover. Um, for the most part, I just like to keep them individual characters. And uh, let the fans decide who should be together if they really want to. How much money do you spend yearly on doll customizing? Oh... 
If you're starting out the hobby, the initial costs of all the materials together can be like up to 200 bucks, but that's because you're buying, you know, you're paying pastels and pencils and Mr. Super Clear Sealant. If you want a really in-depth look on all the materials you might want or need for starting out customizing, I do have a video for that, so I'll link that below. But yeah, after the initial cost, which I paid about five years ago now, um, I spend almost nothing on customizing. I try to get used dolls, you know, save them from the landfill, turn them into a work of art. And the same goes for all the materials that I can use that are thrifted or secondhand. You know, I try to use secondhand cloth and fabric and clothes to make the doll clothes. And I like to incorporate some found objects into my art sometimes, so that's free. If you are trying to be thrifty and budget sensitive about doll customizing, it can be done pretty easily. I've um, got a budget video you can watch if you're interested. So to answer your question, I'd say I'd spend about $50 a year on doll supplies that I need because, you know, the stuff that's most necessary I bought years ago and I'm still using it. So yeah, every now and then I will need another hair color or something and then I've got to pay shipping and since I live in South Korea, the shipping always gets me. <laughs> okay, so thinking about shipping now, maybe I've spent more like $100 a year. Have you ever thought about making a giant doll that's like three or four feet tall? <laughs> no? <laughs> Everyone's different, and I know there's some really big BJDs out there that people like to collect, but again, it's just my preference. But when dolls start to get that big, where they could be like humans, like children-sized, they start to freak me out. You know, when they start getting that big, they become Annabelle. It's like possessed doll territory. <laughs> so, this is all personal preference. I just prefer the smaller 7-inch dolls. They're perfect. I think the biggest doll I would do is like Xerneas size, the 17-inch Monster High dolls. It's pretty big, but it's still not going to come alive at night and eat me. What are your best tips for beginners who want to start customizing dolls? I do have a For Beginners playlist. It's a little dated now, but I'll link that below. If you've watched a couple doll customizing videos and you want to jump in, but it's really complicated and you don't know where to start, I would suggest, you know, start from ground zero. Try doing a new face for a doll. And if you're comfortable with that, Move on to try giving the doll new hair, do a reroute, or make a wig. And you can just keep stacking on the skills until you can make almost the entire doll from scratch. Side note, I see a lot of people say, Oh, I want to start customizing, but I'm nervous I'll mess up, or it's not going to be good. You know, that's just a part of the process. If you never make it because you're nervous, then there's a 100% chance of you never having a doll. You know, I'm trying to say you should just go for it and make mistakes and trust yourself to fix it. You gotta believe that you'll overcome the mistakes you will make. I know it's easier said than done, you know, just do it, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's doll customizing. It's not a huge life decision. It's just a hobby. Like, if you make mistakes, who cares? Do you ever get bored of doll customizing? I can't say I've ever gotten bored while I was making one. I've certainly gotten frustrated at a doll before, but that's different. How many dolls have been victims to your cats? All of them. How did you start doll customizing? I was um, in college my senior year and my final semester and I went to a Target to just do some grocery shopping or something and I was just walking through the toy aisle to get somewhere else and I stopped dead in my tracks when I saw a Cloetta Spelletta from the Bratzilla's doll line and I played with Bratz when I was younger with my older sister, we loved Bratz and so like that all came flooding back and this, does, this doll's design was so unique from anything else I'd seen. You know, I kind of assumed we, we went back to Barbie and it was basically all the same. But this doll looked like a fantasy character. She looked like an anime character. And, you know, that's something Barbie doesn't really pursue. You know, Barbie pursues more realistic things like uh, careers and, and whatnot. So this doll really appealed to me. And it didn't take me long after that to discover Monster High. It didn't take me long after that to discover the world of doll customizing. Before I started my channel, there was Andrea and there was Hextian and some off-YouTube artists like um, Rachel Clemente were very inspiring. No Nap Time was a huge resource for any doll customizer at the time, and still is. And once I stumbled across those and found some others on Pinterest and whatnot, customized dolls, it was just like, whoa, mind blown, I can change my toys to be whatever I want? This is great! Has anyone ever stopped you on the street when you're taking photos of dolls and made remarks? Every time. I'm the kind of person who will do anything to get a good photo. And when you're taking photos of dolls, they're so small, you usually have to get in some pretty strange positions to get a good angle. Which usually means I'm rolling around on the ground with my camera, like, taking photos of dolls. 
Uh, sure, it looks strange. It is strange, but that's kind of the fun of it. People are usually like, what is that person doing? And then they see the doll and they figure it out. Oh, okay, she's just taking photos. Um, when people ask me questions about it, they're usually wondering, you know, did you make the doll? Is the doll for sale? Um, they're, they're just interested to know what, what it's all about. I think a lot of doll artists have told me, oh, I'm afraid to go outside to photograph my dolls. Like, people are going to think I'm a weird kid alt with toys. But more often than not, actually 100% of my interactions have been intrigue and just curiosity. My favorite memory associated with a doll photo shoot was when I had Amanita uh, out for a photo shoot around the gardens by our city hall. And they take really good care of the gardens over there, and it just happened to be the day where they were kind of renovating, like putting in new plants and stuff, so the backdrop looked great for Amanita, she was the fairy doll. And as I was taking photos, the gardener, who was this nice old man, came up and he loved the doll and he asked if he could take some photos on his own phone of the doll and of course I said sure that's fine. It was just so sweet to see this older gentleman take such an interest in my little fairy doll. And of course young children and usually girls are very interested and they want to know if they can play with it and I'm like sorry. Is there a character or idea you really want to make into a doll this year? Um, nothing really in particular. I try not to plan too far ahead because by the time I get there, I might be tired and not want to do that idea anymore. But something I am anticipating is going through the rest of the dragons. I'm really excited about the dragon series. Uh, Air Dragon is next. And so, yeah, the only thing I want to make sure I do this year is get through all the dragons. I'm particularly excited about the Earth Dragon. How many outfits does your mini-me have? And can you do a fashion show with all the outfits? <laughs> I think she's got one for every season and then some because my mini Catherine doll usually ends up getting the prototypes to the patterns I make for the store. So she's got a ton of outfits. And yes, you can have a fashion show. Here's a big one. <laughs> Can you make a Zodiac doll series? Finally addressing the elephant in the room! Okay, so I think I've gotten this question from quite a few people for at least a year and a half now. The truth of the matter is, I'm not that into astrology. It's a great topic, but I just don't think it would be right for me. So I would not be interested in doing a Zodiac doll series. A series this big is, what, 12 dolls? And 12 dolls would take over a year to make, including all the videos and editing. So if my heart's not in a project that's going to take me over a year, like, it just wouldn't come out good. I don't think I would enjoy doing it. So I'm sorry, but my answer is no. If you're craving Zodiac series dolls, though, Doll Fairy's got you covered there. She's doing a really cute Pokemon-themed Zodiac series, and it's great. On a related note, um, I've also seen requests for Seven Deadly Sins, and again, not really my thing, but Cairo's Workshop has a great series going. 
When do you plan on finally sculpting a ball jointed doll? It's not that I've lost interest in sculpting my own ball jointed doll, it's still something I'd like to do, but my other doll projects seem to always take precedence. Like, I'm always excited to start the new stock box or the next dragon, and customizing a fashion doll just seems so much more exciting in the moment than doing a ball jointed doll. Maybe part of it is because it is more familiar. Um, if I do make a ball jointed doll from scratch, it's gonna kinda be a different sort of video, isn't it? So, it's not off the table. I still might do it at some point, but I'm gonna stop saying I'm gonna do it this year because I don't know when I'm gonna do it. Are there any dolls you've made that you've begun to dislike over time? Maybe Xerneas? When I create all my dolls, you know, I give you, I tell you my feelings about them at the time they're created. So the ones that I'm not crazy about now are the ones I weren't crazy about when I made them. <laughs> Nova. But I was really proud of Xerneas when I made her. But looking at it now, especially after the Doll Fairy Xerneas came out, which let's face it, awesome design. I think hers is better than mine. I probably could have done better. Um, when I was making Xerneas, it was the first time I was trying an LED circuit, so wiring something myself. It was my first time working with resin. It was the first time I tried making my own articulated joints for the legs. So she was a huge milestone in terms of technical achievement for me. But when I look at her design, it's like, I don't know, she kind of looks a little bit lazy. All the Xerneas bits are there, but because she's such a big doll, it feels a little empty. You know, she didn't get any clothes. She was supposed to be more goddess monster-esque. So I, I decided not to give her any clothes, but in retrospect, I don't know, she needs something else. She needs something to feel complete. She needs to look like doll fairies, Xerneas. <laughs> How long does it take to make a doll? That depends. So a more standard custom, a week, a week and a half. A very complicated, heavily modified custom, three to four weeks. And this is taking into consideration other things I have going on in my life, too. You know, if you just counted up the hours I was working on the doll, I'm sure it would be much shorter, but I'm accounting for going out on the weekends, you know, going out to eat lunch, stuff like that, school. Do you ever get impatient while waiting for parts to dry or waiting for materials to ship? Yes! It's especially annoying when I'm in a collaboration and you've got people you're working with, partners, who are all working towards the same deadline to have their videos uploaded, so you really have to stick to your schedule. Yeah, so when you're waiting for a shipment to arrive or for the epoxy to cure, and it's not curing fast enough, it, it can be aggravating because I don't want to disappoint my collaboration partners by telling them, you know, I need more time, which has happened before. When are we going to get an airy doll makeover? I have a confession. I finally came to this epiphany where I realized I always preferred working with the fashion dolls and I never chose the ball jointed dolls. A ball jointed doll is kind of this work of art created by a specific artist so it's this other person's work of art. You better take good care of it kind of feeling. It's a, I guess it's like more heavy responsibility but mostly it's because I haven't really felt inspired about what character to turn this doll into. Aerie is a gorgeous doll, so is Verna for that matter, and I decided someone who really will customize her should deserve to have her. So Maya Airy has gone to Moonlight Jewel Dolls, and we all know she's going to turn it into a gorgeous masterpiece worthy of Airy, so I think it's in better hands. Moving on to the next question, how did you get the idea to start making YouTube videos for a living? Well, when I first moved to Korea, I uh, was working at a Korean company. A couple months later I decided to quit and pursue learning Korean full-time before I tried to get another job there. So in that downtime, I had a lot of free time on my hands, I didn't know anyone in Korea yet, and I felt, I wouldn't say lonely, but I was kind of bored. Uh, I needed a creative and social outlet. So that's when I decided to start a YouTube channel. You know, it's a way to share one of my passions, one of my hobbies with the rest of the world, and it's also a very social platform where I could meet other people, other like-minded people. But yeah, it was just a hobby for a long time. I didn't even think about monetizing my channel until well after the Windigos video, I think was the first to hit 1 million views. Yeah, it was just for fun. It still is mostly for fun. It's just an incredible privilege to be able to make money off of something I love doing, and I'm very thankful for that. And I hope I can keep making really fun videos for you. Long live YouTube! Have you ever dropped a doll off of your balcony while applying MSC? Not yet. Will you ever do a giveaway of a custom? Here's the thing about giveaways. 
it can be fun to be in the race with everyone and oh my gosh you might win something from a youtuber and they'll send it to you that part's exciting i get it but if you look at the logistics right the truth of it is potentially tens of thousands of people enter right and only one person wins so when you think about it you know, you'd be disappointing thousands of people. And I don't want to disappoint anyone. So I, I don't think I would ever do a giveaway. Um, because you know that's what would happen. You know, one or two people would be really happy because they won, and everyone else would be like, oh man, I never win giveaways. Besides, the whole point of Delightful is to empower artists to uh, go out and make their own creations. So I know if somebody really did want a custom doll, they have the ability to make it. And if you make it with your own two hands, it's so much more special. As an aspiring character designer, how do you find inspiration for your designs? This one's a little difficult to answer because inspiration comes from so many places. It doesn't even have to be a doll. You know, if I see something on a poster while I'm taking a walk, you know, that's enough to inspire me. Like, oh, that color scheme is really interesting and beautiful. I've never seen that before. Maybe I could use that on a doll. Because I was an illustration major with a focus on character design for game art, I take a lot of inspiration from game art. I think it shows up, you know, with the armor and the over-exaggerated proportions and giant horns and whatnot. So if you wanted to wrap it up, I guess I would say, uh, game art? Pinterest? <laughs> Instagram? and random stuff I see when I take walks. On that note, if you're trying to overcome artist's block, uh, usually what he helps me the best is a change of scenery. So I'll go to the gym, I'll go take a walk, you know, just get yourself away from your project and don't even think about it for a couple hours. And when you'll come back, when you come back, you'll have a fresh mindset. And that's usually when you can get inspired again. All right, this is the second category of questions that are more about my life. Let's go. When did you learn how to sew, and do you like coconut? <laughs> I learned to sew when I was in high school from my mother, who is a very talented seamstress. And yes, I do like coconut. When did you start studying art, and how did you get to where you are now? I've always known I wanted to be an artist ever since I was little, so as early on as I can remember, I was making art. And I've tried a lot of things throughout my life, you know, uh, painting, I loved writing comics for a while, uh, drawing of course, sculpture. I'm a very self-driven artist. If I suck at something, I just practice it and practice it until I get better. Uh, that said, it's also good to seek professional training. So uh, during the summers of my high school years, I sought out pre-college programs. And then for my college, I went to Ringling College of Art and Design and majored in illustration. Wonderful professors at that college. I really felt like I got the professional training I was seeking. And yeah, I think it's definitely made me the artist I am today. And after graduation too, you know, you should never stop. You should always try to better yourself as, better yourself as an artist. I wish I could go oil painting more often. I haven't done it in a while because my job takes up so much of my time, but oh, I wish oil painting. Would you ever get a P.O. box? First of all, I have to say it's so incredibly sweet that any of the subscribers for this channel would want to send me a gift box or some custom doll parts or a custom they've made. It's the thought that counts. I really appreciate it. I do. But for a number of reasons, I have decided not to get a P.O. box. Did you always want to do doll customizing or did you have other plans when you were younger? Like I mentioned earlier, I discovered doll customizing relatively recently. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an artist, but um, I never really had a specific career goal in mind. I just went where life took me. Although come to think of it, when I was younger, I loved dinosaurs, probably because they look like dragons. So I did fancy becoming an archaeologist at one point. What's your favorite thing about living in Korea and any tips for somebody wanting to learn Korean? I really like Korean lifestyle. I think it fits my personality very well. I adjusted quickly, I would say. It's hard to put my finger on it. There are so many things I love about the Korean lifestyle. But just to name one, uh, something I absolutely love is how good the public transportation system is. Like in America, you have to have a car to get anywhere, and I'm the kind of person that really doesn't like driving. So it has just been a blessing living in Korea where I don't have to drive a car ever again. You can just hop on the subway, catch a bus, get anywhere you need to go. As for tips on learning Korean, I mean, it is a very different language from English, so it is hard, except for the alphabet. The alphabet is easy. Thank you, King Sejong. <laughs> other than that, uh, I'm not sure what advice I can give other than try to surround yourself 
with Korean so you can always be hearing it. If you can put yourself in a situation where you can use it, like if there is a Korean mart around where you live, or if you can meet Korean people, um, really just using it every day is the best way to learn. And of course, study those textbooks. And don't give up, I know it can be really hard. Fighting! Out of all the outfits you've made, are there any you'd love to wear yourself? Oh sure! I think I would love to try on Sakura's incredibly pink dress. <laughs> and the one I just made for Jade, I think, could be really fun on a human scale. All the poofy Lolita ones, I guess. How did you meet your husband? Does your husband do something similar to you, or does he do something different? Um, I met my husband at Ringling College of Art and Design. He was a computer animation major. He now works as a 3D modeler for game art characters. So we have a lot in common since we're both artists. We can help critique each other, which is great. And uh, the most similar hobby he has to mine is he loves to paint with the Warhammer figurines. <laughs> He's really good at it. Who is your favorite Disney character? Would you ever consider doing a Disney series? I do like Rapunzel. She's so adorable and she's like really lively. I like that about her character. Mulan's pretty cool. As for a series, uh, I love Disney. Everyone does, right? But uh, not really my thing. I enjoy character design above all things when it comes to making the dolls. So if you take that part away, then it's just not as much fun for me. My heart wouldn't be in it, so not for me. When you're not making videos, what do you do? I am always making videos. <laughs> YouTuber life? When I'm not making videos, I love to travel, and usually what happens if when I get some free time, when I get vacation time, I'll use it to go back home to the States and visit my family. Or if it's a shorter amount of time, like if we just want to go out for the weekend, you know, my husband and I will go on a little, what they call, pinch and yohing. And in a more casual aspect, I really like sketching at cafes. I'm the most cliche artist in that regard. I'll go to a cafe with my sketchbook, you know, get a cafe latte and then settle down with my box of colored pencils and just be there for hours. I'm sorry to the staff. That's the last question, guys. Um, thanks so much for watching. I hope I wasn't too awkward. I don't know how obvious it is, but I'm really not used to filming myself. I usually just see my hands. So, uh, it took a- it, I had to work up the nerve to do this. But thank you for watching. If we get more comments, uh, maybe I'll make a part two down the line. I don't know. Um, next doll is the air dragon. And I'll see you then. Stay artsy. Annyeong.